Well, welcome everybody to the Fasting Transformation Summit, where we are uncovering the most ancient, inexpensive, and powerful healing strategy known to mankind, fasting. I'm your host, Dr. David Jockers, and today we're going to talk about alternate day fasting strategies for chronic disease. And I brought in one of the top experts. He's actually got two uh, best-selling books where he really goes into detail on fasting. He's all over YouTube, and uh, you can find him. I mean, just type in Dr. Jason Fung on YouTube. You'll see all these am amazing videos of his. And uh, we brought him on today to talk about alternate day fasting and really go into a little bit more of the history of fasting as well. And so Dr. Jason Fung is a Canadian nephrologist, which is basically a kidney specialist. Dr. Fung graduated from the University of Toronto and completed his residency at the University of California, Los Angeles. He lives and works in Toronto, Canada, where he co-founded the Intensive Dietary Management Program. He's a world-leading expert on intermittent fasting and low-carb, especially for treating people with type 2 diabetes, and he's the author of the bestsellers, The Obesity Code and The Complete Guide to Fasting. He has pioneered the use of therapeutic fasting for weight loss and type 2 diabetes reversal in his IDM clinic. And you can find his website, IDM Program. That's just all one word, idmprogram.com. And also he's featured on the dietdoctor.com. And so, Dr. Jason, thanks so much for being on the Fasting Transformation Summit with us. Well, thanks for having me. Great to be here. Absolutely. And so I'm curious in how, as a nephrologist, how you really got involved with fasting to begin with. Well, the, um, the most common reason for kidney failure is type 2 diabetes. And the thing about type 2 diabetes is it's really a reversible disease, but it's not taking drugs that really reverses the disease. If you take drugs, if you take insulin, really you're not going to get a lot better. In fact, you just wind up taking them sort of year after year, and every year you go to the doctor, you get more and more drugs. However, uh, everybody already knows that if you lose weight, that type 2 diabetes almost always goes away. So if you have a friend who loses weight, you know, you can almost uh, bet your bottom dollar that that diabetes will get better or go away completely. So it's not a chronic and progressive disease like we've been told. It's really a reversible disease, but you've got to focus on what's important, which is not giving drugs, which is, you know, using the diet to affect weight loss. And that's really where I started. So I became very interested in the question of weight loss and looked at it from a sort of physiologic standpoint, because the thing about it is that weight loss, there's all this um, talk like there's you know no uh, no shortage of books and talk about uh, weight loss and how to lose weight it's big business weight watchers and Jenny Craig and all that sort of stuff um, and they're all focused I think on something sort of not completely relevant which is the the calories they they all talk about calories 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 but when you look at it from a physiologic standpoint uh, the body doesn't count calories it has no calorie receptors it doesn't know how many calories you're eating so it's like if you're taking all this care to count the number of calories then your body doesn't really care about it at all then why do you think you're going to make a difference because you want the body to do something and you think restricting the number of calories does it but the body has no idea what you're talking about like you're talking two different languages so it doesn't it doesn't work and that's where i really got interested in the uh sort of notion and it's really about hormones because the body responds to hormones our whole body works on hormones that is if uh you know if you're hot then you sweat if you're cold then you you know shiver and so on but it's all affected by hormones and our responses and in this case in most cases of weight it's insulin and one of the ways to really reduce reduce the insulin is to use something like fasting and intermittent fasting because it's not just about the foods that you eat it's also about giving your body sort of enough time to digest and let those insulin levels fall back down otherwise you're going to have develop insulin resistance um, which leads to sort of higher insulin and leads to more weight gain so that's sort of how i came around to it um, when I started, fasting was this sort of really, really crazy idea. So we started doing it five, six years ago. And boy, like you should have seen the reactions of people <laughs> to the very notion of fasting. Like, whoa, you're going to kill people and all this stuff. It was uh, insane. It's like, what? You mean the human body cannot survive more than, you know, really it can survive more than three hours without putting muffins in my mouth? 
um, it was really just this crazy idea. And that's why nobody had been using it. But luckily, uh, I, I know a lot of the physiology and I also do this a lot in the hospital. So we tell people to do it all the time. We tell people, oh, hey, if you're going for surgery, you have to fast. If you're going for colonoscopy, you have to fast. If you're doing fasting blood work, you have to fast. So it's like, okay, it's no big deal. Your body can handle it, no problem. So why can't we use this as a therapeutic measure, as something that we can use for weight loss, for type 2 diabetes? And I thought there's actually no reason why you can't. It's just that we've all been so accustomed to these sort of um, – you know, all these people telling us that you have to eat, you have to eat, you have to eat, you have to eat. And then it's like, oh, I wonder why I'm so fat. And it's like, maybe because you're eating all the time, right? It's like, give yourself a break. Just do something simple as, you know, giving yourself a, a period of fasting sort of every day, or if you want, extend that fasting. Yeah, absolutely. And so when you got started with this, especially with diabetic patients, were you getting a lot of kickback from people? Were people, um, how, how compliant were people? Um, well, I have an advantage because they know me and they trust me and they know yeah. that I'm looking after them. They know that I'm following them. They know, I, I tell them, look, if you're not feeling well, of course, stop it and then come back. So people um, did trust me because I was their physician, whereas um, they were getting a lot of flack from the people around them saying, oh, you can't do this. You can't do this. That's crazy. And their doctors, their dietitians, their friends would tell them that you can't do this. Um, but on the other hand, you know, I was treating them. And then after a while, they saw the results. They saw, hey, look, if I do this, my sugars come down. It's like, well, of course, if you don't eat, your sugars will come down. And then you don't have to take so much insulin. I'm like, And they're like, yeah, that's pretty logical. <laughs> <laughs> so we started this in about 2012 or something. And we got these incredible dramatic results. We actually just published a case uh, series. We had three patients. We published in BMJ case reports and um you know in these three patients it was they they had been diabetic for 10 type 2 diabetes 10 to 25 years and they were all on insulin and other medications and some of them were on like five years of insulin and uh within uh five to 18 days we actually took them off all of their insulin wow. and yet their blood sugars stayed the same in two of the three cases, we took them off all their medications. The other one came off sort of three out of four medications. So dramatically reduced the number of medications they, they, they took. They all lost weight because, again, if you don't eat, you'll lose weight. And it's like, is there anything more basic than that? Um, and But we showed that we could really use this in a therapeutic manner and reverse these people's diabetes because you have to understand that if you are taking less medication but your blood sugar is the same, then your underlying disease is actually much, much better, which means that it's reversing, which is what we knew anyway, because everybody knows that. It's just one of these things that we all sort of, um, you know, a lot of doctors, especially in diabetic associations, pretend that this is not possible. It's like, what do you mean it's not possible? Everybody already knows that it's true. Bariatric surgery, for example, we've done all these studies where people lose weight through bariatric surgery. Diabetes almost always goes away. So we know it's reversible. It's not the disease. It's the treatment of the disease that's completely wrong. That is, we're using all these drugs for a dietary disease and wondering why what didn't work. And then when it didn't work, the Diabetes Association was just, would say, well, that's just the way that the disease is. I'm like, no, it's because the treatment is all wrong you got to focus on a diet. It's a dietary disease. Focus on the diet. You may or may not succeed, but at least consider using these other options, including fairly intensive options like, like fasting. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I've been saying throughout this summit that fasting is the most ancient, inexpensive, and, and most powerful healing strategy. And so I know you know a lot about just the history of fasting. A lot of people, Plato, talks about how he fasted for physical and mental efficiency. And can, can you go into a little bit more of the history? I know you've talked about that in a lot of your books. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's some of the sort of smartest, most influential people in the world were huge proponents. So you go back to, say, religion, for example, and almost every single major religion in the world, you see fasting sort of all throughout. So whether it's uh, Catholicism, Judaism, Buddhism, Hinduism, you know, you could go on and on. I don't think you could actually find a major religion that doesn't have fasting as sort of part, 
part of its core beliefs. So you know that people have been doing this for thousands and thousands of years without any problems. Um, and then you get into the ancient Greeks. So uh, people like Hippocrates uh, were big believers. And then you get into the sort of modern American era. You had Benjamin Franklin and Mark Twain and people like this. And they'd have quotes like the best of all medicines is resting and fasting. So Benjamin Franklin, interestingly enough, um, wanted to, he was, I think, governor of Pennsylvania or something at, at one point. And he actually tried to make uh, one day a week, a uh, mandatory sort of fasting day. <laughs> he didn't succeed, <laughs> but he tried because he was such a big believer in it. And it's like, okay. That would um, cut down our healthcare costs quite a bit. <laughs> I know. That is a pretty yes. good idea, but yeah. obviously it's hard to tell people what to do. Yeah. So anyway, it didn't fly. I mean, <laughs> he's lucky he wasn't lynched for it, right? But, <laughs> <laughs> but he, he was such a big believer. And, and it's like, okay, these are some of the smartest people in history, right? Benjamin Franklin is like, whoa, this guy is like a, a genius. Um, you know, Mark Twain, very, very smart. And so you see that throughout history, people have accepted this. It's, so it's been used for thousands of years. It's literally the oldest dietary intervention in the book because there's other dietary interventions, like there's paleo and there's keto and there's veganism and stuff, but they don't go back like 5,000 years, right? You don't go back to at least 2,000 years, the time of the ancient Greeks and so on. Um, so this is this has been there. It's worked. It's been done without any problems. And people always say, oh, the people will never do it. It's like, you know, people have literally been doing this for the history of the world, right? It's like you're saying that people could do it from, you know, all the way up until, say, 2018. And in 2018, it's impossible for humans because our physiology has changed. We need to eat every three hours, right? It's like, no, the human body is the same as it was in the time of the ancient Greeks. So, uh, you know, this is this is one of those things, right? We're not trying to reinvent the wheel. We're not trying to say, oh, you know, I've got the latest and greatest because these are the things that are always sort of crazy to me that you can come up with some kind of miracle food, right? Whether it's some, you know, berry or green coffee or raspberry ketone or whatever it is and you can sell it. And it's like, okay, so here's the thing. What are the chances that smart people all over the world have somehow missed this miracle berry from the Amazon for, you know, thousands of years. And since 2015, we've discovered the secret to life. <laughs> I don't think so. You know, if there is a secret to life, I think we would have discovered it at least a thousand years ago. And it's like, okay, that's funny because 2000 years ago minimum, Every sort of major human group, religious group, um, sort of figured out that, hey, fasting is pretty good for you. Every once in a while, if you fast, and that's where the word breakfast comes in, right? It's a meal that breaks your fast. You should fast every day. Um, it's kind of healthy. There's a time you should eat, and there's a time you should fast. And that's really the basic cycle of life. Every once in a while, you do a longer fast to sort of cleanse the system. Right. And that's what almost every human, you know, every group of humans in the history of the world had kind of come up with by themselves um, that this was something that was really good. And it's like, yeah, hey, it's, it's, it's one of these ancient secrets. It's been there for this whole time, but it sort of disappeared um, in the last sort of 30, 40 years. And I'll tell you what happened um, in the 60s and 70s. They did these crazy fasting studies. Um, you know, you read them now and you're like, wow, I can't believe they did that to people. And remember at the time, they were more worried about uh, world hunger. So if you remember the Malthusians and stuff, in the 1970s, we were actually talking about two global calamities. One is world hunger, and two was world cooling. <laughs> world cooling never happened. Now we have global warming. Because uh, at the time, interestingly enough, they, had, they thought that the dust particles in the air would reflect the sunlight and we'd have an, hmm. another ice age. So Time Magazine had this great cover with a penguin on it. <laughs> and that didn't happen. Um, and the other big worry was the uh, uh, you know, rising human population and we're not going to be able to feed ourselves. So both global warming and, um, and obesity as a global issue took us sort of by complete 
surprise. Nobody was expecting it. We all expected the opposite. And uh, they did these studies about fasting just to see what would happen. And they'd fast these people who are not even obese uh, for like 60 days at a time. It's like, okay, that's not a very good idea. Like, <laughs> um, but at the time, you got to remember, they're, they're trying to see what happens to a human body under these conditions of extremely low food. And it's like, so they're looking at things that are different. So they're taking, you know, guys who weigh 140 pounds and giving, making them go two months without eating, which is totally different than giving a guy who's 300 pounds with type 2 diabetes no food for 24 hours. Right. Mm -hmm. It's completely different. Yeah. It's like you, and, and so there is a bunch of problems that came up with, uh, you know, those people, some, some people actually died. Uh, it was pretty bad, but those were sort of what you'd, what you'd say now is fairly extreme sort of uh, conditions. And yeah. so it, it's much different two months of fasting versus 24 hours. So what we're talking about these days, which is more intermittent fasting is much shorter. So the risk is much lower. All these things that the people died of, which is something called refeeding syndrome. Um, it doesn't exist. You really, really need to go more than five days without. So now we're, we're more focusing on sort of frequent short-term uh, fasting, alternate daily fasting, that sort of thing, as opposed to these long, drawn-out fasts, which was sort of the, the rage back, back in the 60s and 70s. And that's when everything fell out of favor. So, and then we started talking about, oh, you shouldn't eat three times a day. You should eat 10 times a day. I'm like, okay, well, that's, that wasn't a good idea either. Yeah, absolutely. And they say that because they feel like it stokes our metabolism. But like you were saying, I mean, we've been fasting or practicing fasting far longer than we've been practicing eating five, six meals a day or whatever it is that people do. And so, uh, you know, really, uh, I know that fasting actually improves the metabolism. Can you go into some of the hormones and how that yeah. works? Yeah. yeah. So this is all sort of pure physiology. And this is one of those situations where people repeat something often enough. And then since everybody's saying it, they, people think it's true. So both the, oh, you stoke your metabolism, there's actually no science behind it. There's no studies behind it. And, um, you know, if you think eating all the time is going to make you slim, like, go ahead, try it. Did it work for you? And it's like, well, I think I know the answer to most people. Like, yeah, sure, some people are going to do fine with it. But there's a whole lot of other people who don't do fine eating eight times a day. Um, but the, uh, the fasting, they've done a lot of studies on the metabolism. So what they're talking about is the basal metabolic rate, which is the amount of calories you burn at rest. So you're not talking about exercise uh, because exercise is voluntary. This is sort of like the amount of energy it takes to uh, generate body heat and keep the liver and the kidneys and the brain working sort of in a relatively normal fashion. And what's interesting is that if you take somebody who is fasting for, say, four days, up to four days, and measure their metabolic rate at the beginning and the end, you'll see that the metabolic rate is actually 10% higher at the end of four days of not eating. And that's because you have something called a counter-regulatory hormone. So um, when you eat, insulin tends to go up. When you don't eat, insulin falls. But then there's other hormones which run counter to that. So they're opposite. Insulin falls and these other hormones go up. So uh, it's a sympathetic tone, which is sort of our fight or flight response. So something that's energizing. Um, noradrenaline goes up. Uh, free fatty acids go up. So again, as you're depleting your body of the sugar, it's sending out fatty acids so that you can have a source of energy. So some people worry about that, but that's actually natural, normal response. Uh, cortisol does go up. So if cortisol is your problem, fasting is a stress on the body, of course. But just like exercise, low amounts of, of stress are actually good for you. That's the, the principle of hormesis. So those are the counter and growth hormone. Growth hormone is also a counter regulatory hormone. So those are, those are what keeps the metabolism raised up is the, the adrenaline and so on. And then the growth hormone is there and it keeps your lean mass. And everybody says, oh, you're going to burn your muscle again. No evidence that that's true. And, you know, they've done lots of studies and a lot of people point to the fact that, hey, if you just look at the period of fasting and somewhere around 24 to 36 hours, you get this period where you, you, you break down protein to generate glucose and they say, wow, you're breaking down protein. That's so bad. But what they don't understand is that if you look on the other side, what happens when you eat again? 
your growth hormone is sort of through the roof, so you rebuild those proteins. So you, what you're doing instead of just breaking down protein is that you're actually breaking down protein then rebuilding what you need, which is very powerful. And in, in the five years, uh, five, six years that we've been doing this, we actually haven't sent a patient for uh, skin removal surgery. Mm. And we have pictures, we have uh, pictures of people who've lost like 100, 120 pounds, and they're uh, you know putting their pictures up uh, as just... Um, you know, talking to a fellow uh, who had written to me and he's saying, you know, he had lost some weight. And then when he started fasting, he noticed that all his, his skin was changing and it's like, Oh, that's fantastic. And then that it all tightened up because the body is smart, right? If you don't need protein, you're going to break it down, but that's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. And then you rebuild it. So this is also gets into the topic of autophagy, which is something that fasting is very good for, which is again, this process of breaking down old protein and rebuilding them. So it's a renovation cycle. It's actually rejuvenating, almost an anti-aging sort of a process, as opposed to leaving the old protein there, which is then when you do that, you have all this excess skin that never got metabolized or catabolized, which is broken down for energy. And then you have to use surgery to cut it down. But that's really bloody surgery. Mm -hmm. A lot of blood vessels, there's a lot of protein. Remember, when you're taking out the skin, you're not taking out a lot of fat. That's all protein. It's mm -hmm. all connective tissue. It's all skin. That all that protein has to go if you're going to look good. Otherwise, you're going to have flaps everywhere. So that's that's sort of um, you know some of the some of the things that happen during fasting that are really really beneficial. So these you know keeping your metabolism high, you know breaking down the protein autophagy. There's so many benefits to this that you know the the, the sort of ancients knew it, and we're just sort of catching up with our science now. Yeah, absolutely. And so as people start going into, let's say, like an alternative day fast, and they're normally eating, let's say, three meals a day, and they get to, you know, breakfast or lunch, whatever meal it is, what happens with their hormones? Because a lot of times people will feel hungry around the meal time, yeah. right? But if they can just kind of drink some water, you know, just kind of pass through that period of time, it seems to go away. And can you explain that in more detail? Yeah. So this is what we say, we tell people in our intensive dietary management program, you have to expect that the hunger doesn't continue to build. So everybody worries that, oh yeah, it's 12 o'clock, I'm skipping lunch, you know, I'm going to get so hungry. Um, you are hungry. Um, so you be prepared for it, but it comes in a wave as it, as it passes, it goes away. So if you measure something called ghrelin, which is the hunger hormone over 24 hours, what happens is that the, um, uh, ghrelin goes up at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So there's a learned component to it. But then if you don't eat, ghrelin actually just falls back down to baseline. And what the bottom line is that if you are, um, you know, if you've ever worked through lunch, you know this very well, that at 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 1.30, you're pretty hungry. But by the time 4 o'clock runs around, you actually feel the same whether you ate or whether you didn't eat. There actually is no difference. You're back, the ghrelin is back down to baseline. Your hunger level is back down to baseline. So this is sort of both the physiology and the um, and the uh, clinical experience shows this, and uh, that's that's one of the big worries. The probably the biggest worry of people is that they'll just be so hungry they can't deal with it. But if you know that it's only going to be you know an hour, an hour and a bit, have some tea. We tell people you know have some water, have some green tea or something like that, and then just ride out the wave. Then they can do it. If they think it's going to just keep getting worse and worse and worse and worse they have no hope. And I've done this many times where I've, you know, I, I, you know, not necessarily deliberately, but I've been so busy and it's like, oh, I'm really hungry. It's 12 o'clock, but it's, you know, I'm so busy. So I just keep working. And then it's like, okay, well, by the time it passes, it, it passes and, mm -hmm. and it's done. And then you don't think about it again, because again, you're just busy. So staying busy is actually one of our you know, yeah. really important strategies for making it easier, especially around uh, meal time. So if you're used to sitting down every lunchtime, then it's going to be tough. But if you all of a sudden think, okay, well, why don't I just keep working and then go home an hour early? Yeah, hey, that works, right? And then that you're you now you're making, you know, that that fasting in, you know, you're building it into your schedule. And the great thing about it is that when you're doing these sort of alternate daily fast, short fast 
it's it's not difficult in a working day because if you don't eat breakfast, mostly the people don't notice. If you don't eat lunch once in a while, mostly people don't notice. Um, skipping dinner is sometimes a bit more hard because it's sort of family time and all this sort of stuff. And that's why sort of a 24 hour fast dinner to dinner is yeah. often very easy to sort of slip right into a working schedule without even anybody uh, knowing particularly that you're even doing it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I do that regularly. I do actually three days a week where I do a 24 hour fast and then two days a week or the rest of the week I'm doing two meals, right? And I actually feel great. You know, I feel yeah. really fantastic, maintain my muscle mass and I uh, just feel really, really strong. So, um, you know, it definitely does work. And I know in your um, IDM program and in your books, you've been a big fan of this kind of alternate day fasting uh, protocol. Why, why can that be so effective? Well, I think it's really a matter of um, what works in this sort of modern schedule. So yeah. alternate daily fasting, 24 hours is, as you say, very, very easy to slip right into this normal sort of Western professional lifestyle. Like we go to work, you know, we come home, that kind of thing. Um, obviously, it's more difficult if you have shift work or whatever. But nevertheless, that's that's one of the things. And if you do it on a regular basis, then it's it it just becomes sort of like habit. Yeah. Uh, and forming habits is really important because it sort of puts your mind into autopilot, right? So it's like you don't even have to think about you know, are you eating or are you not eating? You just sort of slip into the, the, the habit. So it's no longer sort of willpower. It's sort of like just a baseline. So if you skip, say, breakfast, and I'm not saying that skipping breakfast has anything magical about it. Uh, it's just that breakfast is usually the easiest yeah. <laughs> meal to skip for a couple of reasons. One, everybody's in, in a rush to get to work and it just takes a long time to make a proper meal. So people usually eat like toast and stuff and that, that's just not that good for you yeah. or get a muffin and that's just not that good for you. So it's the easiest. And then once you get used to it, it's like, I, you don't even have to think about it because yeah. it's like I, I'm so used to it. I just have a coffee. Even on days I could eat breakfast, yeah. um, I, I don't. And once in a while I do. Um, so the other day I thought, okay, I'll have breakfast. And I was a little bit hungry. But, you know, I was meeting some people. So I'm like, yeah, I'll have breakfast. And I just felt, you know, actually really off. Because <laughs> I'm just like, yeah. oh, I am like way too bloated right now. Right? <laughs> the whole day. And it's like. Uh, so, so putting, you know, forming these sort of habits is important because it, it means that you're no longer having to exert willpower, which is sort of, you only have so much willpower uh, to use. So if, if, if it's, if it's just automatic, that's great. And that's where these alternate, and if you skip breakfast on a regular basis, then it's just skipping lunch every so often, which again, doesn't become so hard. Um, and if you build it into your schedule, like, okay, it's like, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Fridays are my busiest days. So those are the days that I plan to go right through. Or this podcast is like, you know, I build that right in. And then I go to, you know, I go down to the hospital to do the rest of my work. And it feels like a normal day. And yeah. that, I've, I've not had to consciously say, okay, this is a fasting day. I'm going to grit and bear it and stuff, right? It's just sort of flows right in. So that's, that's how it works. And, and it's nothing magical. I mean, you can do a seven day fast and derive the same benefits as, you know, seven days of 24 hour fasting, but it's, it's much more disruptive to a sort of schedule, much more disruptive to sort of this habit formation. And that's why it works for some people. It doesn't work for other people, but it works for some people. As you get into the 36-hour fast, and again, uh, for type 2 diabetes, it's a, we, we tend to go a little bit longer in the IDM program for type 2 diabetics just because they have a more severe disease yeah. and because we want to reverse that disease before they develop a lot of um, end organ damage. And uh, again, 36-hour fast is a little bit more disruptive because now you're skipping breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, but on the other hand, you derive a greater benefit uh, from it. But again, it's not that long that you really have to worry about things like refeeding syndromes um, and you know, other, you know, really arrhythmias and all that sort of thing uh, that you see in the longer fast. But we use all of them. We use intermittent yeah. fasting. We use extended fasting. It really depends on the inter individual. But alternate daily fasting is just one of these things that is easy. It's sort of a lower level of fasting that a lot of people can do. Even we have like 75-year-olds and 78-year-olds. and You know, they can do it no problem. 
So do you guys just kind of like tell them, okay, here are the different fasting strategies, pick whichever one you want to, you want to start with. Is that we how you usually, guys- we usually talk to people and then make a recommendation. Yeah. Um, but you know, if you've never done any of them, then you don't really know which one you want. So we usually right. start with 24 to 36 hours, depending yeah. on the situation. If you're older, we'll go, you know, a little less intensive. Mm-hmm. If you're younger and more sick, then we'll go longer. So those are all, uh, it's all, it all is individualized. And then you, after that, you work with people yeah. to do. So we have counselors who will work with them. And then again, the main thing is support. So we yeah. put people into groups in our IDM program um, to, to get that sort of peer support uh, for, for, for the fasting. Cause it's not fun. I'm mean, like, yeah, I'm, right. like, I'm not saying it's fun. I'm saying it's something that can have a lot of health benefits, yeah. but I'd rather eat pizza and donuts myself. <laughs> so it's, it's not something that, um, you know, it, it is something that we should try to support and make easy. And we tell people what to expect and, you know, how to deal with hunger, the waves of hunger and so on. And what you can use, like, you know, green tea, for example, is something that we recommend a lot. There's some, some, um, antioxidants in there called catechins, which are um, thought to be very good for uh, appetite suppression. So green tea works very well because you've got antioxidants, you've got some appetite suppression, there's like zero calories, zero sweeteners. So, hey, that's perfect. So, you know, um, there are fasting teas out there that we recommend, one made by Peak Tea, for example, that I helped them uh, develop a sort of line of fasting teas. That's like a, you know, to just give you a little bit of support because it's, it's something that, you know, if it's difficult, then we have to support people. Just like when people yeah. go through chemotherapy, we don't just throw them at it or surgery. We don't just say, Oh, here's surgery, no anesthesia for you. It's like, no, that's not, <laughs> that's not helpful. It's like, you need surgery, but let us do everything we can to make it easy. So we'll give you, you know, general anesthesia will give you pain medicine, you know, anti-nausea drugs and all this sort of stuff. It's the same idea. This is what you need, which is fasting. Let us do what we can to make it easy for you so you can derive the benefits, whether it's weight loss or type 2 diabetes. Yeah, absolutely. And I I find that fasting is kind of like exercise. Like you got to build the fasting muscle. You know, I first started fasting. It was really hard. It was daunting mentally and physically. And then, you know, after doing it for a week or two, it was like, Oh, this, you know, it became so much easier. So, yeah, we tell people that too, and that, that's what they need to hear. It's just like running, for example, or weightlifting. You, you know, if you've never lifted weights and then you start and do a lot of weights and you're like so sore, you're like, well, this is really bad. Like, look, my muscles are so sore. It's like, this is the stupidest thing, right? No, it's like, you got to expect that. And we tell people the same thing. You know, the, what? The first couple of weeks are going to suck. You're not going to be used to it. The hunger is going to be high. You know, you're, you're, you're going to have a lot of trouble, but you have to try and just get through it. You can do one of two things sort of you know so we do give you know we do talk to you like you can either build up gradually or you could try going to a sort of very low carbohydrate diet and then fasting for example so yeah. when you do that of course it, it makes it easier because your body is actually used to using body fat sorry dietary fat which is the same as same metabolism as body fat so whether your body uses fat that you eat or fat from your body is actually the same same metabolism so uh doing that can make it a lot easier or you could just jump in and do like uh you know a three-day fast or a five-day fast and just get your body used to it in a hurry and i I always say like it's like a pool right there's some people like to go in the shallow end and other people will cannonball in the deep end one will work for someone one person another will work for another person and some people you cannonball in the deep end you just go in dive in and just do it and then you know suffer through yeah, it works pretty well for a lot of people yeah and then after two weeks i say always give it a couple of weeks because you can't tell if this is something you're going to be able to do don't give up after the first three times because it is going to be hard yeah yeah that's having the right mentality going in now i know you work with a lot of diabetics and obviously people with kidney failure so what do you find with electrolyte levels as they fast any special considerations there not really. Um, most people do fine. Again, we're not doing these ultra long fasts that most yeah. people that they used to do. But even I'll tell you when they did. So the world record for fasting was actually 382 days, which is incredible. Over a year, this guy didn't eat and they measured his electrolytes and so on. Um, they wrote it up in a paper. And in fact, 
he had no problems. His calcium levels were normal. His, you know, sodium, his potassium, everything was sort of normal. And so we don't see much problems with electrolytes. And that's the point is that the body is actually designed to use this fat uh, as energy for when you don't eat. So you don't need more electrolytes and stuff. Uh, you know, the, of, of the problems that we do see, some people who are, you know, they go a little low in salt um, and actually get a bit dizzy and so on. So some people will actually take salt and water, for example. We use for, for people who are on it longer or whatever, we tell them to use bone broth, which is not truly a fast because that that's, you know, not water sort of thing. Some but calories. In there. Yeah, there's calories, there's some fat, there's some yeah. protein. So it's not a true fast. But again, I'm not interested in being a stickler on, you know, oh, yeah. you broke your fast. I'm interested, are you getting better? If you are, then hey, use the bone broth. Uh, but that allows you to put salt in because it's hard to put salt in your coffee, right? Or salt in your tea. It's weird. Um, some people use salt in water and that's all right. And some people um, will actually just take some salt. Magnesium is the other thing that some people get a lot of cramps and so on. Yeah. So again, um, sometimes a bone broth is helpful because there's a lot of electrolytes in there and that helps. And the other thing is uh, Epsom salt baths, for yeah. example, is something that you can do during fasting that will boost up your magnesium levels. Yeah, good stuff to know. And so basically, like if somebody's eating one meal a day, kind of like what I do, um, I'm eating a lot of calories in that one meal. So even though I eat low carb, I'm still getting a you know pretty good rise of insulin for that one meal. But if I broke that meal into like three smaller meals to get the same amount of calories, I would have a lower release of insulin each time. But let's talk about like the net overall, the amount of, to phrase this question, like just continually spiking insulin three times, like let's say throughout a day, or if I were to eat five times, as opposed to like in a one hour period of time, just getting a big rise and how, the, how that would impact the body there. Yeah, so it all comes down to insulin resistance because the thing is that if you have, so if you look at hormones, for example, any hormone in the human body does not stay at a certain level. So if you look at growth hormone, if you look at parathyroid hormone, every hormone spikes up and then goes back down. If it goes up and stays high, what happens in the body is that the body quickly becomes resistant mm -hmm. to it. Um, so it's kind of like if you listen to headphones and you're putting on very loud music, right? Your body adapts to that loud music by becoming a little bit deaf, right? So it's too loud, so you actually can't hear it as well. Uh, the, so you, you need not only a high stimulus, but you need that persistence of stimulus. Right. And, and, you know, that's the whole point. It's not the same thing. And three is probably fine. So, you know, if you go back to the seventies, people ate three meals a day. Yeah. But remember they ate sort of eight, eight o'clock in the morning, 12 o'clock, six o'clock. So 10 hours of feeding and 14 hours of fasting. Which right. Is different than nowadays, which is sort of like 15 to 16 hours of feeding yeah. and eight hours of fasting. Like uh, that, that's sort of a standard of uh, what we're eating, what we're doing now. So, it's, not, it's the persistence of that stimulus throughout time. And that's why you don't see that in the human body. So everything is pulsatile. All hormones are pulsatile. So again, it's like if you're in a very dark room and you go out in the sunlight, right? It's not even that bright, but you're blinded because you're so used to the dark. The body is the same way. If you, if you are constantly exposed to something, the response to it goes down and down. It's the same with insulin. So if you're constantly exposed to high insulin levels, then you're going to become resistant to it. And that's, that's where all the problems start. So you yeah. really have to keep insulin, like any of your other hormones, pulsatile. So yeah. you have to have a period of low, um, low insulin in order to prevent that resistance. And that's the point. Yeah. So I always say, think about the story of the boy who cried wolf. So he cries wolf. Never, all the villagers come running and then he cries wolf like you know over and over and, and then they, they stop coming because they know he's not telling the truth well is the answer to that boy's problem now to cry wolf but a little bit softer or is it to stop crying wolf yeah it's like well the answer are pretty obvious our body is the same we have insulin resistance because insulin is crying wolf constantly so we become resistant to it 
Now, if you ask all the experts, they'll say, oh, you know, you'll eat six, eight times a day, but eat a little less. That's the boy crying wolf, but a little softer. That doesn't make any sense at all. <laughs> you need a period of time where you don't cry wolf, and then all the villagers are like, okay, he's learned his lessons. When he cries wolf, they all come. Again, it's the same thing. Yeah. If insulin goes up, spikes up high, and then goes down low for 18 hours or 14 hours, which remember, 14 is a, used to be the standard. Now you've totally reset your, your sensitivity. Now when insulin goes up, it's sensitive again. So the whole point is that it's not simply the, the foods that you eat. It's also the, the way that you eat them can impact um, your hormones and it's this imbalance of hormones that is leading to obesity. So it's not the total calories, but it's the way it's spread out. It's even if you took the same amount of insulin, but you know, spread it out versus a single spike, it's a different physiologic response. Yeah. Just like, just like every other hormone in our body. Absolutely, absolutely. And so as we finish up here, what are the biggest mistakes you see people in your program making when it comes to fasting? Well, I think that there's uh, two. One is that, you know, to uh, fit it into your life, right? So don't do something like, you know, oh, you know, people start out very enthusiastic and then they think, I'm going to change my whole life. It's like, no, you don't want to change your whole life. Remember, flex, uh, it's flexible. You can do it whenever you want. Um, so don't go trying to force it in where it doesn't fit because you'll never be able to keep it up. Like, you know, for example, some buddy once uh, said oh you know he used to meet his friends every day for, not every day you know every friday or every thursday for lunch or whatever and he did stop that because sometimes it'd be a fasting day i'm like no no no, no, no. you can fast on wednesday <laughs> and go have a friend lunch with your friends on thursday because they're your friends you don't want to be doing that right it's flexible you can you can move it around so you know always um, make sure that this is something that you can do because we're not interested in the short term. You know, you can lose weight all, with all kinds of things in the short term. Um, and then the other thing I, I'm always is uh, I'm always telling people is like, you know, you always get this question, oh, does this break the fast? I'm like, it doesn't matter. Um, fasting is about lowering insulin, right? You're you're providing a period of time where your insulin's going to fall. So say you have you know, a handful of nuts or something like that. You, you know, you're caved and you had a few nuts. Your insulin's dropping and then it's going to blip up a little bit because it's not that much, you know, insulin. And then it's going to start falling again. It's fine. You can do great. So if you're doing great with your sort of cheats, whether it's bone broth or even food or, you know, whatever it is that you want to sort of cheat with, but you're doing good, hey, why do I care? Like, I'm not interested in being right. I'm interested in you getting better or mm -hmm. reaching your goals. So it's the same with artificial sweeteners. We don't recommend it. But some people say, yeah, I do great with them. It's like, if you're doing great with them, do it. Like, I don't really care. <laughs> you know, don't be like a slave to like, oh, well, you know, Dr. Fung said that's not actually a fast. I'm like, no, no, I don't really care if it's a true fast or this or that get to, you know, get what you're looking for and then decide what you want to do because everybody's different. You can give the same diet to two people. One will lose 50 pounds and one will gain 20 pounds. We know that. Everybody's different. So why would I obsess about, you know, following this diet to the letter? You do it, you make some changes, you see what, you know, makes you better and then that's it. Good, good, good words of advice. And so any uh, final words of inspiration for our listeners? Yeah, I think that the, the main thing is to understand that this is something that they can do, that people have done. Um, it's just a matter of getting the right information and the right support. And that's yeah. really it. And then you can take control of your health because so many people have done so many diets and they're like, oh, I don't want to do another diet. It's like, but, you know, this is, this is one um, something that people have always done. And two, not a lot of people have tried this sort of thing. It's relatively new on the scene. So you, you might want to just give it a try because it's not only effective because if you don't eat, you'll lose weight. Um, it's also been time tested that you can actually do this. So, you know, give it a try and see how it goes. As with anything, you know, get the right information, get the right supports. Um, but yeah, give it a try. Like, what do you have to lose? It's free. Yeah. 
Exactly. So <laughs> it's like, come on, there's, there, it's, it's not like we're trying to sell you like thousands of dollars <laughs> worth of books and supplements and stuff. We're just saying don't eat for a while. Yeah. You know? So what do you have to lose? If you don't like it, stop. If you're feeling unwell, stop. Get some information, get some help, get some support. But hey, what if you do great? Well, yeah. guess what? You've just changed your life by, by, for, for, for free with just some information and, 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 and help from friends. Absolutely. Well, Dr. Fung, thank you so much for your time. I just want to acknowledge for you for all the great work you're doing, breaking down these fasting myths, getting this information out. You know, I just had a patient in my clinic uh, like last month and I'm a big advocate of ketogenic diet, intermittent fasting, and I've been telling him this forever, diabetic patient. He said a friend of his gave, gave him your book. He read your book, started doing alternate day fasting, and he's dropped like 50 pounds. And I'm like, well, <laughs> thank you, Dr. Funk, for helping my patient. So appreciate you. you just getting that information out and uh, making such an impact. And for all those that, that are listening out there, I just want to remind you, just like Dr. Funk said, you know, fasting has this ability to unlock the dormant healing potential within you. It's safe, it's effective, and it just might transform your life. So it's free. Go ahead and give it a shot. And if you've enjoyed the interviews in this summit, consider owning the entire Fasting Transformation Summit for yourself. That way you have lifetime access to all the MP3s, uh, video recordings, transcripts, everything you need. And it's especially helpful if you're starting fasting or if you're gonna do an extended fast. So listen to interviews like this, be encouraged, be empowered, and uh, go out and transform your life and your health. So if you do that, we would be honored and we'll see you on a future interview. Be blessed.